Okay, so then uh, we'll go ahead and get started for now. Call the uh, Wednesday, October 28th, 2020 select board meeting to order. And uh, first thing on the agenda is a tri board meeting. So we're going to talk about the uh, special town meeting warrant and consent agenda. And also, we've, um, it sounds like the CPA has agreed to combine some items so we can hopefully streamline this. And we also need to make a choice on uh, the budget uh, so we can set the tax rate as well and uh, possibly move some money from stabilization. So uh, David or Carolyn, do you wanna kinda tell us where we are with this and what our options are? I think Certainly. David can lead with that. I'm trying to get my computer to, there we are. Certainly, so um, the, the last meeting of the uh, select board, we talked about uh, trying to trim as much from the special town meeting warrant as possible in order to reduce the amount of time that people have to be in town meeting because we thought the longer it went, the higher the risk for transmission of, of the virus may be. So to that end, the select board has agreed to put together a consent agenda that consent agenda um, covers four articles, Article 1, Article 3, Article 4, and Article 5 on the consent agenda. That can be dealt with right away. The, um, the uh, um, CPA committee combined the three independent uh, cemetery articles into one omnibus article having to do with the cemeteries, and so they're on board with that. So we started out with 18 articles. We're down now down to 12, and we can combine four of those into one vote. Um, so I guess the first thing that um, uh, we need is for the finance committee to agree that the consent agenda should include those four articles. A month ago, we said that for for so do you just need us to make a vote right now to add those articles to the consent agenda? In North Carolina to vote twice, which is felony voter fraud. You know, take back please, uh, please make sure you guys stay on mute. Alarms, but it is a Republican. Got it. All right, good. Thank you. So just, just to review what those articles are, um, the first one is for prior year bills. There's uh, the bills associated with DPW that came in after the close of the year. Um, the article three is to transfer fund balances from old bond productive articles uh, back to the pots that they uh, originally came uh, from. Article four is the revolving fund for electric uh, permits, electronic permits. And then number five is the account transfer to make up for the shortfall of uh, CPA spending on uh, Zaturka Park. That's $1,410. All of these have received both select board and finance committee approvals. All of them are housekeeping items. So the only thing we have to do is hear from the finance committee that if uh, they agree that these are uh, appropriate to put on to the consent agenda. Okay, so do I have a motion from the finance committee to put these on the consent agenda? So moved. Seconded. Okay, so we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, the uh, the next thing is uh, the select board is looking at Article 2, which is the general fund budget. The Finance Committee has a pre previously approved this budget, but uh, or recommends this budget, uh, but there's a larger discussion that the select board would like to uh, have with the with the Finance Committee. Uh, the budget is balanced. Um, uh, right now, so it's not an issue of, of uh, trimming the budget in order to make a, uh, to achieve balance, but the impact on the taxes is going to be substantial. 
for FY21 as things stand right now. Our tax rate currently is $12.78 per thousand. That's going to drop, but because of the increased values of the uh, residential properties, um, there's, there's going to be an increase in the tax bill that the average single family household uh, would experience. And so to that end, the select board has um, looked for ways to mitigate that impact. The first one is that they went to the treasurer and they uh, asked that debt, that principal debt uh, that is above the levy be deferred, uh, which can be done. That is a net savings of $175,000. The schools very generously have offered $375,000 of their current year budget um, because they do, they're, they're not experiencing the expenses that they thought that they might need. Um, so because of the peculiarities of municipal finance, um, we can <laughs> the budget for the schools by 375,000, but they can return at the end of the fiscal year 375, which would be converted into free cash for next year. To make use of that uh, 375 this year, the select board are proposing to take this like amount out of the stabilization account, uh, which if you combine that with the reduction in the debt, and the 375 from the uh, stabilization account, that reduces the tax rate down to $12.15, which would equate to a $52 impact on the tax bill for an average single family household. In order to achieve a $0 increase to the uh, average single family household tax bill, we would have to take another 155,000 out of stabilization in order to bring the tax rate down to an even $12. And so this is up for discussion at this point. I mm -hmm. went through this very quickly. Uh, I, I emailed people the, the, the balances uh, and the uh, Excel spreadsheets and the options laid out. Um, we have to think about this as a two-year process uh, because if we artificially depress the tax rate too much in FY21, the tax, tax bill in 22 will be that much higher. There are things that we can do in 22 in order to mitigate that tax increase in 22, um, but if we use all of our resources this year, there's not going to be those resources available for uh, leveling out or cushioning the tax increase in FY22. Um, <clears throat> so I was pushing for this uh, zero increase in the tax bills for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because we don't know what the rest of the year is going to be businesses are already struggling. So this will help people across the board, both uh, on residential properties and commercial, um, you know, evenly. So um, I understand this is kind of a, um, you know, hitting the savings account to do this. But I think if there was uh, ever a reason to do so, a, a pandemic is it. Um, that being said, you know, none of us know what's going to happen in the future here. So if we have another, if FY22 is as bad as this year or worse, uh, the reality is that, I mean, we're going to need to look at, at other things such as layoffs, furloughs, things like that, because we can't just keep dipping into the savings account and, and, and spending it to, to keep our spending level the same as it has been just because. So, um, so I'd like to see the, the 155 out of stabilization for this year to keep the, the tax rate or the tax bills the same. And I would also like to see the 375 uh, from free cash go back to replenish the stabilization from the school. 
I, I, can I speak? Um, I feel this is a good option for us right now. Um, I think if we can get through this 21 um, and we can all keep our fingers crossed for 22, at least we're solving the problem. And I think by 22, I'm, I'm being more optimistic that things will be back to normal and our taxes and our uh, funds for coming in from hotel and restaurants and things will be back up um, to where that it should be. It's not a guarantee. Nothing in life is a guarantee. I understand that. But I think right now with the way that people are struggling and not having um, their jobs and everything is on hold with, with their um, their taxes, they're paying their rents and things like that. Um, I think this is a good option for us right now. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept this with further discussion, of course. Um, but I'd like to uh, make a motion to accept this process um, with the realm of opening up the uh, town warrant uh, to take the money out of stabilization and, um, does that have to be two separate uh, motions? No, you can wrap it all into one. Okay. So with opening up uh, the stabilization account to take this out and then reimbursing the stabilization, when we're able to take the money at the end of this fiscal year and put it back into that stabilization account. And this would be for the, tw the goal of having a $12 tax rate, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second that. All right. We have a motion and a second. And then let's hear from uh, the finance committee as well as the rest of the select board on this. I have a question. What was the increase in taxes last year for the average house? I think Dan Zadonik's on the, uh, the line here. He can help us out with that answer. That's something that I'm going to have to check. It won't take me long but if you want to hold on for a second your cat's a little fuzzy there david yeah i tried to shoo her away but she just keeps coming back <laughs> sorry i have to hope this isn't too distracting <laughs> no not at all it's kind of fun david, david you're still using that cologne catnip <laughs> that you see <suggested? laughs> <laughs> Well, Dan is looking for that answer. Um, you know, we do have to think about FY22. Um, can, I, can I, well, we have to wait. I did make a motion to open up the warrant. And John, you did second that, correct? Yeah, I, I just, we can't put taxpayers through this right now. We got to help them in every way we can. Even though we're down to somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of revenue coming in right now, we need to do something for the, the homeowners here. And I understand this is kind of rolling the dice. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping our revenues rebound next year for the hotel and meals tax. Uh, you know, hope doesn't really get us very far as far as paying the bills, but. Um, like I said, if it doesn't work out, then we are going to need to seriously look at other options um, for FY22. But all the uh, finance committee, you guys have anything to say, Paul? Yeah, I, I have a couple of things to say. Uh, first of all, I think that we are in the position of uh, being on a, uh, we need to throw some lifeboats in the water. And I don't know that it makes sense right now to not throw as many as we can in the water because right now it's a major crisis. And I think if we're in a situation in 2022 where revenues are even worse, where more businesses are out, uh, there's going to be a much bigger need for a solution that's well beyond Hadley that's going to have to come from the state and the feds. And I think we can't, I don't think we should be holding back on trying to resolve the problems that the people in our community have. I think we have a responsibility to throw as much of a lifeline out there to people um, to not overstress them. Um, you know, we gave out 2% raises across the board this year. And a lot of places didn't see raises at all. And and frankly, I think it could have been argued that we could have held that back if we needed to. And I understand we have contracts, but if, you know, I think moving forward that, you know, when you talk about, gee, we might be looking at layoffs, you know, we didn't even approach issues like that this year because I think we were a little bit rosier on what we thought was going to happen. So I'm in favor of doing this. My only other question is, 
maybe for treasurer uh, for the treasurer is is doing this going to affect us on our on our bond rating rate and i only bring that up because if there's an unintended consequence that increases our you know our rate that changes our rating to a you know down a grade um do we end up in a situation where you know we save the money here but all of a sudden we're paying a lot more on our debt rate want me to answer now yes yeah. um we just had our our rating um and because we were doing the borrowing for the 7.2 million dollar bond we and uh, we had a rating last year because we were borrowing the uh, seven something million dollar bond last year. We don't have that kind of bond uh, borrowing coming up again, and there won't wouldn't be a reason to have uh, to have the rating revisited at this point until we're doing that level of borrowing again. Nonetheless, we certainly uh, don't want to take any action in the meantime that would, would, would that would jeopardize that. Um, I think that there is recognition. I know that there is recognition for the, the, the same recognition that says, yes, you've been doing great with OPED, but this is a this is just one of those years. Right. This is uh, uh, I think that we are sort of under that same okay. uh, protection because right. this is one of those years. Now, if we were going to say we're going to throw that much and next year, we're going to just deplete that stabilization fund over the next couple of years before we take any other steps, such as what you mentioned and, and other steps as well. Um, I think that uh, we're good for getting through um, through this year, and I'm I'm not concerned about it at this point. And just to go a little further, I actually do support it, and I've been very protective of our capital accounts. Um, I do support it because it is something that is actually a benefit to the entire town, and we have selectively done things as a town to help out various interest groups with, with very good reason. But I think it's off, it's awfully good to have something which really benefits all taxpayers and which shows that we're we're that you're really thinking of everybody and and not looking for regular taxpayers to com, um, continue subsidizing other groups. So I, I am in favor. I don't think it's all that much to take out at this point. We're still going to have three quarters of the stabilization fund that we that we um, have had. And um, I think if we put this on, as, as uh, Amy has suggested too, can we make a, a plan, and Joyce, uh, a plan for building this back up? Um, we will certainly try and do that just as we will try and fund OPEB again. Um, but first we need to get through this year. Linda? Uh, I Linda, aren't we up still 10% above what we should be for the stabilization in taking this money? Isn't there a, a, a 5 10% thing that we look at when we're looking at sta the stabilization account? Um, I think uh, that that's one of the criteria that's in uh, David Nixon's uh, sheets, what percentage that we want to have of our... Uh, are, are you there, David, on that yep, one? Um, um, yeah, that was one. Of, I think the... the, the Select board voted on that a few years ago. I'm, I'm still of the we want to hit two million dollar mark, Joyce of the of the uh, I, I, finance always, committee. But David has new criteria. I did also say all the time that we should keep it at two. But yeah, I'm with um, you. <laughs> yeah, but under yeah. these circum under these circumstances, I think you know uh, it won't as long as we can still put that money back in at least the three seventy five and hopefully more. We'll see what next year brings, but at least we know that we'll have the 375 to put back in there um, at the at the July 1st, I believe, right? That money becomes available. The, the, the three, yeah, the 375. Um, I actually, we're not at three quarters of it taking that out too. I was really thinking that that is just going to get re restored. And I think it's an extra 155 that we don't have that direct to plan for restoring. Okay. But um, but between those two, by getting putting the 375 back and take in, um, but not the 150, we're still at a, we will still be at um, over one and a half million dollars in the stabilization. Okay. So um, I know there's some unknowns still. Uh, I, I think we possibly have some money for North Hadley Village Hall if that ever closes. Um, ambulance, we don't really know what we're getting. I mean, we can't count on that, but I know that there could be some money there. Um, you know, leftover money in other departmental budgets. I think, um, although all the department heads have done a great job kind of saving as much as possible this last, uh, you know, in FY20, at the end of FY20, uh, the same thing has to happen in FY21, unfortunately. I know we're, that's asking a lot, but um, every little bit helps at this point. So, yeah, I think we asked most of the, uh, the police chief, the fire chief, everybody recognizes the the issues that we're in right now 
And yeah. I mean, you know, if we need to level fund for a year or two at this point, we're just going to have to do it. Yeah. Sue has something. And uh, Linda is going to start on the sale of French Street, which, depending on what we get from that, well, that and the, it's the same as the North Hadley Hall. That's, that's capital. Yep. And I think that either of those is capital to replace or capital makes sense. Um, okay. I think if we keep that in mind, as opposed to capital going to supporting the operational, because once we start using any capital fund um, for operational, that's when we're starting down a slippery slope that will be harder to climb out of. But um, I think if we think of, of supporting, using stabilization for the operational fund for this one year makes sense. But I would hope from now on, or from oh, that we would revert to our policy that capital goes, goes to capital because they're, they're just one-time items. And um, what, But on French Street, mm -hmm. that would be replacing revenues that weren't gotten because of- That's true. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's true, but- um, well, it's up to select board at that time to decide. I mean, <laughs> well, I see it as capital at this point because we didn't have it to spend. So, but it's yeah, we'll see. We'll we'll, we'll talk about it then, or they will. Okay. Any any other further discussion on, on this topic? I would just I want to keep it moving. We have a six o'clock. Right. Uh, yeah, motion. Yeah. Support the quick. No, sorry. Uh, the average tax bill last year went up one eighty seven. And also, uh, if we put this 155 into from stabilization into lowering the tax rate, we'll end up having 900,000 in excess levy capacity for next year, uh -huh. which is good from a budget planning purpose, but it would raise the average tax bill by almost $300 uh -huh. if we had to. If we used it. If we used the 900,000. Okay. And what was the tax rate last year per thousand? Uh, 1278 was last year. And this year we're going to be $12, but the values went up. So it offsets. Any further discussion? My no. concern is if it went up 180, whatever last year, and if we go down to zero this year, and then next year we have to go up to 300, that's a hard pill to swallow. But if we kept it, if we went up 52 this year, it's less than last year. We could sell it at that and not have as far to dig out of the hole in the next fiscal year. We don't necessarily have to go up the full 300 next year though. That's the thing, if, if we're still struggling financial or the economy is still struggling people are still struggling we can do with less if need be that's what we're talking about james you know if we need to level fund for another year and some of the contracts are coming up and if there's no raises and you know these are things that we that we're going to need to consider in a long period in a long period of time here and and over the next year you know I think we just need to do, do this on short term right now. This 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 uh, affects our businesses. This affects our households. It affects the whole town. I hear you, and I agree with needing to help people now. But we need to tell them that it may be worse next year, and they shouldn't expect to to ride with no increase next year, because otherwise, it's not full disclosure. Well, I guess the question that poses too is, you know, if we were confronted with this situation, would we, you know, this year we're not talking about laying anybody off. We're not talking about making any budget cuts. Next year, we might be faced more with that and less with keeping taxes level. Yeah, I mean, I think that we reassess when FY22 comes up and if the economy's as bad or worse, I don't think we're going to have to, we're going to have a choice. We're going to have to do something. So I think all those options are unfortunately going to have to be on the table, but you know, we'll kind of cross that bridge when we come to it. This is a, this is a, re, a roulette wheel that we're tossing right now. And I think living in the moment and helping people right now 
uh, and we'll just try to make the best of it again next year. And hopefully we can work something out. So they're not going to get a $300 bill. We will work diligently to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, you know, we, we got to all work together on this and that's all the departments and everybody. So it's like I told the uh, DPW director, we're going to count every grain of salt we put on the roads this summer, this winter. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Five zero from the select board. And then um, does the finance committee want to vote on recommendation on the new article twelve? All right. Do I have a motion um, regarding what was just discussed on the twelve dollar um, tax rate? It's like Paul raised his hand. So moved. Sure. Second. Okay. okay. Do you have any more discussion on it? Um, does anyone have any more questions? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I, didn't, I didn't see Valerie's vote. Did she vote yes? Okay, I guess that's a yes from Valerie. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else you need to hit, David, on the warrant? Two, two items only. Uh, the select board has still to take its uh, recommendation on the capital article, Article 7. Um, David, did we just, uh, we opened the warrant. Was there anything else that we needed to do by placing that warrant on, or are we all set with that? Uh, no, I, I will take care of the, uh, the changes to the warrant uh, based upon your vote tonight. Okay, so we didn't have to do anything different. Thank you. All right. Can I get a motion to close the warrant, though, Joyce? Yes, yeah, so I'll make a motion to close the warrant at this point. Do, do we want to keep it open to discuss the other things, or do we want to close it? I don't mind seconding, but I can second, but I didn't know if we wanted to keep it open. I didn't think there was anything else on. Maybe any, anything else we need to keep it open for? No, but uh, you should make a recommendation for or against the capital article. All right, so we have a motion and a second. We'll hold off on a vote for it for just a minute. So article seven, go ahead, David, what's that? All right, this is a capital article that uh, um, consists of the DPW well, Water Callahan Well Number One Reconditioning, 25000 That's coming out of water reserves. Hadley Media is spending down its uh, 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 capital budget within its reserves for in anticipation of uh, renegotiating the agreement uh, in the next four years. So they, they're asking for 18000 And then... Borrowing within the levy, which is borrowing that does not affect the taxes at all. There's a cruiser for the police department for 63,000. The five-year replacement, scheduled replacement for the police ballistic vests for 21,250. Fire department has to replace an administrative vehicle for 64,575. The fire department is, needs to replace its extrication airbags for 35,000 and the DPW is looking for 40,000 for a mower for the West Street Common and Zaturka Park. Okay, so the uh, well reconditioning for me, is not an issue because that's coming out of water reserves and that's something we need to pay for one way or another for the uh, filters. Uh, Hadley Media, Hadley Media Reserves. I know the um, Ballistic vests is something that can't be put off because they expire. Uh, the police cruiser, I know that's needed for our certification um, or accreditation, I should say. And uh, anybody that's seen uh, the deputy driving around in his current department vehicle knows that he certainly needs one that's not going to fall apart somewhere on the road. Uh, the extrication airbags, I know the chief will tell you that the ones we're, we're using, I think, are unserviceable or, or, or not usable currently. Uh, the only one I have a question about is the DPW mower at this point. Do we, 
John, do you know anything about that? Or I think Chris is here too. No, I, I really don't, but I, I'm, I'm really against all these capital items right now at this time. You know, I, the, the, the annual town meeting is coming up soon enough where we can put all this stuff on. And with the situation we're in, um, it's quite a bit of money we're talking about. We could, we could easily save that $155,000 right there. I don't agree with that. I think if it's not going to be any taxable um, thing that we that we should do these at this time, we don't know where the money is going to be next year. Um, certainly the equipment for extrication, bullet vest proofs in the vehicles, I think are important for the departments at this point. Um, and things of you know like that i think that we need to do this at this time while we have the money and it's not going to tax the tax dollar we don't know what it's going to be next year so i think while we're able to do it this year we should Chris. i was on board with john on saying let's put off some of these um for the capital as well but when talking with the capital um group we all decided if we did push it off too much I mean, we cut it down a lot. And if we did push them off too much, what's going to happen is it's going to um, snow, uh, become a big uh, snowball on us. And we're going to have too many. And so next year, we're expecting so much more. Um, we're going to have a, a big problem, especially with the Route 9 coming up. One of the things that we talked to the police chief about is we wanted to, let, you know, can we go without one more vehicle every year? And he said yes, but he we decided let's do this let's do the fire or the police cruiser this year and forego next year so we're already talking about next year we just don't want it we're trying to put it over the two years instead of hit, getting a hit all at once so uh -huh. i'm afraid if i if we take this now and move it to next year we're going to get a double correct correct thank you yeah, I'm on board for keeping all these on the Capitol too. Like Amy said, we trimmed it way down. And, um, you know, as David said too, I will agree that DPW mower could be up for negotiation, but I do think we have to keep everything. Um, we have cycles that we've agreed to. Some of this equipment needs replaced. I think we should just stick with it. What What is the administration car for the fire department too? The chief's got a brand new vehicle. That's for the deputy. He's currently driving a uh, surplus vehicle that some sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Uh, I think Chief Smeknibble's on here. That's correct. I'm on here. Do you want to tell us about uh, Evan's vehicle? Absolutely. The Evan's vehicle was supposed to be <clears throat> short-term fill, so we purchased a $2,000 uh, surplus from UMass. And the costs right now to try and keep it going are well be above the $2,000. Um, if you all remember, my vehicle was actually a, uh, David Nixon and myself worked with uh, Rep Cybeck at the time and got a state appropriation for my vehicle, but there was an issue with the year that it was done. So it was pushed a year back and it ended up, uh, instead of us getting a second vehicle, we pushed that funding to the police to cover one of their vehicles. So. We're, we're desperate for that, and we're also desperate for the airbags as they were actually part of the uh, ballot vote that they didn't pass. So we do not have any working airbags right now. They had to be taken out of service last year. So um, I think both of them, we're, we're well overdue for them. Absolutely. Okay. Could I get a motion, please? Make a motion to accept the capital uh expenditures at this time i'll second any further discussion all those in favor aye aye no aye okay and then uh finance do you want to vote real quick on that one or did you already they've, they've done that already okay great and then uh if i could get a uh all those in favor of closing the warrant aye aye Jane saying yes, and I'm saying yes. John? Yes. Just need to have you sign the warrant now. Okay, great. 
And then um, we're going to skip the public forum this evening because we have a full schedule, it looks like. And I know we have uh, Mass DOT next. So unless there's anything else for the tri board, I think we can. Uh, Randy, do you, have, do you have anything that you want to relay before we? No, I just wanted, wanted to see what was going to happen with the warrant. And uh, that question, Article 2, was my biggest concern. So now that I know where it's headed, I'm fine. I, everything's good with me. We can move forward and hope uh, for decent weather and a quorum. All right. Bring winter coats. <laughs> for sure. All right. So I'm sure we'll be in touch before the meeting, but uh, I've got something I need to do. So I'll say good night to everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. Okay, so if that's it, then uh, that will conclude the tri board portion. And thanks everybody from finance and schools. And then we'll move on to uh, the next order of business, which is uh, Mass DOT widening. And so, who do we have on for that? So they may not be on yet. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they were going to be out. We had them coming at 6.15 because we thought it was going to take a little while. Ah, okay. All right, then we can move on to some other things. Let's do a uh, consent agenda instead. We have, uh, Jennifer, the warrants are not in there. Do we have any or no? We, we do. I just realized they're not in there. Um, sorry, maybe Linda will save me as I frantically look for them. Ah. That's okay. We can come back to that as well. Sorry. That's okay. Public comments. Anybody here for public comments? If you are, please turn on your camera, wave, or make yourself known. Yeah. Okay. That's easy. And then let's move on to uh, Mass DOT 7.2 here. Mass DOT, no left hand turn onto West Street. Um, I had reached out to District 2 asking about making it no left-hand turn in either direction from Route 9 onto West Street to kind of cut down on the cut-through traffic. Uh, the gentleman I spoke with over there said, uh, sounds like a good idea, but in order for them to officially review it and sign off on it, they needed a vote uh, from the select board and a letter from the select board making an official request. So what I'd like to do is to have no left-hand turns on to West Street, wait, I think it's Waitley Street, and then Goff Whale. Street as well. It's Whaley Street. Whaley Street, and then Goff yeah. Street as well. Correct. Um, and hopefully this will cut down on cut through traffic as well as um, uh, some of the accidents that we get with people rear-ending cars stopping to make that turn. I'm going to make a motion to have us uh, draft a letter or send a letter to DOT uh, requesting that uh, no left-hand turns from West Street to the center of town to the lights. Could I get a second? Yeah, you know what else? I, I'd still like them to consider the. Uh, that's a second. That's a second motion we're coming to, John. Well, no, I'd still like the state to consider the uh, no turn on reds at least off of Route Nine at Middle Street. That's, that's what, what I was talking about. <laughs> that's what I just was talking about, John. So we have to do two separate ones here. So I'm doing the first one: no left hand turns from West Street to Middle Street until they come to the lights. And then we're gonna draft another letter asking to the removal of the signs, a no, no, don't turn on, no turn on red. So we wanna remove those and we're gonna draft another letter and send it to them for that reason. Yeah, I, I mean, we voted on that a, two years ago, you know. Well, we're, gonna, the, we're gonna send them a letter. So can we get yeah. a second on that? John seconded, I believe. Yeah, I'll second them both. Okay, and Sue had a question. I have a question. Um, is it no left-hand turn onto the streets? Or because I'm thinking about no left-hand turn into the church or Dunkin' Donuts or, um, the, you know, the businesses on that side, if someone's coming from over the bridge to go there? 
Yeah. I, my intention is the streets only. Uh, the businesses are, are, are different, but the streets and, and the goal here is to reduce the cut through traffic to I, North Lane, Rocky Hill and all that. Right. I just, yeah, but even thought you might want to end your, but most, even, but even going to Dunkin' Donuts, you can go take a right on left onto middle and just drive into Dunkin' Donuts there. You don't have to access Dunkin' Donuts from Route 9. That causes problems there also. Yeah. You know, they can just drive in and, and go up to the drive through I mean, they don't have to go in that way. You know, that causes accidents too. You know, they still turn left on uh, cross path. They still turn left going into the malls, Mountain Farms Mall, and there's signs there and everything else. There's been accidents at both of those places. Yeah. And so we just would have the signs there to, to make the attempt to uh, control it. Bill. Correct. Um, I did have a question about whether you were going to. Excuse well, me. You have to mute yours. Is your phone on too? No. Nope. You want to have your partner in crime turn hers off. Okay. Is that any better? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, good. The question would be whether it's going to be no left turn going in both directions because there is also a lot of left turn into uh, West Street of, of Esalon patrons. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be tough to try to make it no left hand turn into every single business and driveway on both sides of the street there. I, I think if we focus on West Street um, and the other two small streets. I think it's a better start. Um, also, someone just pointed out to me that uh, the you know the school buses turn into Hopkins as well, so we don't really want to prohibit that as well. So what I was referring to was were people going westbound and turning onto the south half of West Street at Esalon. Uh huh. So it is a street. It is not a not a business entrance. It is yeah. making that turn at the street level. I mean, um, I'd be okay just prohibiting the eastbound turns, the cut the cut through traffic there as a start. Would that be okay, Joyce? Yeah, I I think right now um, we have had and it has proven. We can also ask Mike to chime in on this. Um, he's not on, I don't think tonight, but I know that most of the accidents have happened with people turning onto West Street, not the other way around. So, I mean, most of the documentation is from going towards Amherst and turning onto West Street, taking that left-hand turn. There's been some miserable, bad accidents at that corner. Um, so that's what we're trying to avoid. And, and people just all of a sudden throw on their brakes. They either go down the first side of West Street or the second side of West Street and it just causes havoc right there in that in that section. Um, so I think if we just concentrate right now on the left hand turn, see how that goes, and then we'll um, certainly monitor what happens to the other side, taking a left going west. So let's do one at a time. All right. So can I? You have one any? question. Would this be in lieu of the speed bumps on North Lane? No. No, in addition to. No. But if you have no traffic on West Street, why would you need them? Because you have the huh? traffic coming the other way, eastbound, or I'm sorry, westbound, coming down 47, making the right on North Lane, then West Street Cemetery Road. Yeah, and I spoke with the chief after he sent that email to us, and uh, he agreed. I called him the next day after I thought about it. And if we're going to put two speed bumps on North Lane, we should really put two speed bumps on Railroad Street. Well, we're going to be monitoring. They're not going to be able to go down Railroad Street if we have the no left-hand turns. I, I understand that, but coming the other way, they'll still be going down there. Okay. Can we talk to anybody on West Street to see if they would rather not be able to take a left in their, their 
on their street anymore. Cause I mean, there's what 50 plus houses over there where people live and now they're not going to be able to turn onto their street anymore. I just feel like the select board coming down and mandating that is, is a lot more, I've I don't I've know talked. if you feel like you, you know, all of a sudden you can't turn on your street. Um, one way that's, that's can be, you know, or get I a ticket. I don't think they're going to mind it because they're not going to have the traffic there. You know, if they want to just take a turn at the lights and then come down railroad and go on their street, that's perfectly fine. They'll, they still have an option of getting to their house. Um, I, I think they'll be more happier without that excess traffic going 50 miles an hour down either side of West street. You can ask them that. And I can, I can tell you, they'd be more happy with that than them having to take another turn and go into their house. I, I just feel like we should make, give them notice or have a hearing or something to hear their opinions before we just do it. Well, have you heard from anybody? I haven't heard specifically from anybody. I just know that. So, you know, I, I, did meet up with someone, I did meet up with someone in the grocery store and then they were all in favor of, of having the change uh, because there is a lot of traffic that goes that way. The only thing I've heard from North Lane or West Street residents is they want something done with speed and the number of vehicles. I, right. Anybody, I, yeah. I hear some complaints about the speed bumps on North Lane last time that people wanted one ways and whatnot. And I just explained, hey, you know, we'll take it one step at a time. Let's, let's see what the effects are. And, and yeah, I think we really took care of the speed problem by putting a fresh coat of tar on it. They ought to double the speed on West Street now. So we'll have some real problems to deal with in the future. Yeah. Um, so this is a request to the state. Um, we can certainly solicit comments in the meantime. And then if we get a whole bunch of people that say, no, absolutely not, we don't want that, I'm sure we can withdraw our request down the line. But I imagine this is going to take some time anyways from uh, DOT. Uh, David? Yes. David and uh, Carolyn, if I may. Uh, Eric Christensen from MassDOP. Uh, Ann is also uh, a Rich Massey. He's the project developer for District 2, and he's on. And uh, I think you're on, right, Rich? Are you on? He could speak. Uh, I saw him on earlier. Yep, he's on there. He's just muted at the moment. Okay. Okay. Yes, I'm on. Here we go. We're, uh, we're just finishing up discussing uh, from District 2 uh, making a request for no left-hand turns from Route 9 to West Street. Um, I had spoke with someone over there, and they said we needed to make a formal request to do that. Um, so I don't know if you can – would you be able to shed any guy, uh, light on that subject or just the well, – I mean, Yeah, I, I've heard about that, and I, I think, again, one of the things is just to consider – the consequences of if someone can't turn left where you're going to prohibit it, then where are they likely to go, whether it be some of that cut through traffic or the people who live on the street? And, you know, what is the uh, what is the next thing that someone is going to do once you take that option away? And is there potentially some negative uh, negative consequence? unintended that comes out of that. So just to, you know, uh, be careful of that. I think we're trying to make sure that we can divert the traffic to use route nine and mm -hmm. be their flow through so that everything just flows in one direction or the other and not have these cut throughs all through town, which I live on Bay road. So of course I've got a lot of different traffic going my way heading over towards UMass and Hampshire College and Amherst College. So, I mean, I, I have pretty good traffic on Bay Road. Um, but I think in, in, in diverting people and having them go down, down Route 9, as you have widened the road, you've made it more accessible. I think that if we can keep the traffic that way, I think it's going to be better for everybody. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of accidents on the corner there of Echelon, uh, and West Street, where people have just all of a sudden thrown on their brakes and they want to turn down West Street. So we've seen a really good number of bad accidents at that intersection there. And I just think it would be nice just to keep the traffic flowing, 
don't let them turn left, keep them going towards Amherst. So mm -hmm. that's, that's our general thought on, on why we want to do this. Right. So I have another thing just to throw in the pot to think about, and that is uh, when COVID is no longer with us, the West Street Common used to be used for many public events. This is going to throw a real problem into people trying coming to Hadley to go to an event and not knowing other options to get there when they can't turn left. Well, a lot of those options, they've had um, some of those on the south side of the common. They can always take the go down Bay Road and come on to West Street like they always have. So there's many other options for them to get there. They don't have to, or they can come down Route 9 and just go to the south side. Or if it's on the other side, they can still travel up, go to Middle Street, and then come back down again. Uh, we don't want them crossing Route, route 9. That's the, the whole gist of it. Or if there is a function there, then we would have police that would be directing the traffic there. I think that might be a better option to actually have police and let people turn left during special events. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it can be worked out. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, it's the start of um, a project and a thought, and I think, you know, it can be worked upon. Yeah, I just don't want to lose it because that was something that people uh -huh. from away used to talk yeah. about, how they enjoyed coming to Hadley and Vent on the Commons. Yep, and that's, that's fine. I think that's a good thing. We're one of the oldest Commons in Massachusetts. Why not enjoy it? You know, on the other hand, Joyce, you're going to have people, there's no change of direction circle going east and west. You're going to have people pulling into businesses and crossing four lanes again just to get across and to get in to turn right going eastbound. So I, I, I don't know if we're going to be really saving anything by not, by putting these signs up on, on coming coming eastbound well i think we should give it a try if we get approval from dlt um we can give it a trial of six months and see um how it works and if not we can always make a change things are changed nothing is written in stone i just still feel like we need more study on this you know traffic study something to be able to see what the impacts are i just feel like you know, there are a lot of impacts of doing this and to just make a decision and do it and try and see how it works. Like you could inconvenience a lot of people. There could be a lot of trickle down effects that we're just not seeing in a 15 minute select board meeting. We are not, we board. are the throughway for UMass and Amherst. So everybody that travels down there and they did, Mike, Mike had a, uh, gave you last week, he gave you how many people were traveling just in this short amount of time in this pandemic that we're going through, the amount of traffic going down North Street is still astronomical. And it, we're not even in full swing right now with UMass being back up to par. So, you know, the numbers that he gave you last week is certainly something that you should have looked at. And I'm, not dis I'm not disagreeing with that sentiment, Joyce. I'm just saying that How many I agree, there are way too many cars that go down that road. It's just, we're making a decision with no information. Oh. Or but there's no study. How hey, many so, studies do we need to do? This is the whole Joyce. problem. Joyce, I'm, the, uh, I'm, I'm muting myself. Goodbye. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the gentleman at DOT that I spoke with said, once we make the request, they'll have their engineers look at it and look at the unintended consequences of what happens at the Route 9 and Middle Street intersection uh, before they say yes or no to the request. So this is not a, you know, they're, they're not relying on our studies. They're not relying on just the request. They're going to look at the data is what I was told. They just wanted a formal request before they started that process. So uh, Exactly. And, you know, last meeting I told you that the count that we had on North Lane of five or 600 cars uh, was on top of the 40,000 cars a day that you have just going down Route 9. And the police chief said that's that was the latest accurate number from the state count for vehicles on Route 9 every day. So yeah. you're, you, I don't know if you're gonna be overloading Route 9 with another 500 cars on it or not. I don't know, can we take a vote? We still have DLT waiting to speak with us. 
All right. All those in favor of making the request for uh, the no left turns onto the north portion of West Street. And the other and the other streets. Oh, and uh, Whaley and Goff Street. Aye. Aye. Any other yeses or noes? <laughs> no. I don't know. All right. I'm gonna say no. All right, so two, two, three. All right, so that fails. Okay, so we'll move on next to um, the Route Nine widening project. Sorry to keep you waiting for a few minutes, guys. And so we have John Tamburini, I believe. I see him there, and uh, Richard Massey and Eric Christensen, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So the reason we wanted to chat was uh, this project is coming up. We had a couple of uh, concerns that we wanted to talk about and, and really a, a couple of requests. One of the biggest, I think, requests or the most important in my mind is whether some of this work can be done at night because when this is going to be happening, we've already got businesses struggling with COVID and then we're just going to have a you know, a, day a daytime construction mess for a year for the businesses to deal with when they're trying to, uh, you know, trying to recover. Is it, can we do any of this at night? Uh, yes. Um, so we certainly understand the concern with the disruption and certainly a major project like this. You know, there's no way to do it without some disruption. But um, most of the time, we believe that the operations that'll be happening will be able to keep at least one lane of traffic in each direction flowing at a time. Uh, at the same time, um, there are some operations that won't have enough room to have a lane in each direction going. And there will be times where that traffic will have to proceed in an alternating fashion, but uh, for those times, we will certainly request that uh, approval to do that work at night. So there'll be some portion of the work uh, that's the most disruptive to the flow of traffic there that we'll, uh, we'll seek to do at night. And, and that'll help both the users of the road and the abutters who uh, are living with the construction every day. So I... I guess I interpret that as basically a, a no for no, most. Yes, there, there is some work that can be done at night, um, but you know, uh, daylight is certainly the preferred time to be doing construction from a number of uh, point of view in terms of safety, um, cost, and um, you know, the, mo the vast majority of the work we would hope can be done during daylight, but when we do expect that it'll be most disruptive in terms of not being able to keep a lane of traffic in each direction going at the same time, we'll look to do that at night. Okay, can we can we get a pledge or of some sort that that will be the case, that whenever there can't be one lane of traffic in each direction, that, those, that work will be done at night so we can tell our businesses that that's the case? Um, well, I, you know, there, there's always exceptions, but yes, I think you can say that um, you can expect that when traffic is not able to be maintained, one lane moving in each direction at the same time, that work will occur at night. Okay. All right. David, is there yes. any, any chance that they would put it off for a year, given the impact of the economic disaster that happens when construction's going on on a road? All right. So, uh, you know, that, that's a good question and it relates to maybe some of the other stuff we'll talk about. You know, this is a $26 million project that is a part of a five-year program of spending in the Pioneer Valley that um, needs to budget, you know, the, their amount of spending uh, for each of the five years of the program. And it's 
important that projects stay on schedule and happen when they're programmed to happen because moving one project is not possible. You know, to move a project later means taking some other project that's currently scheduled to happen later and either pushing it further out or finding something uh, that is able to move up and happen sooner. And that may sound easy, but given what needs to be in place to actually for MassDOT to advertise the project for bids and move it to construction, it's not very easy. So it's important that this project stay on the schedule that it's currently programmed and that everyone is expecting it to happen on. Uh, we have already, you know, based on concerns from the town, we had the Bay Road Bridge Replacement Project that was going to be happening. And we've already pushed that one back three years uh, so that it wouldn't have traffic impacts before the disruption from the Route 9 project is over. So, you know, we're, we're working to sort of do what we can to minimize it, but it's really important that this project stay on the schedule that it's currently funded on and not start, um, you know, changing the schedule of this project and other projects uh, if this project, again, can really is able to move forward and is ready to move forward as currently scheduled, which would be MassDOT putting it out for bids um, next year. So in, in fact, you know, the construction and the disruption of this isn't going to happen till probably uh, the very end of 2021 at the earliest. So, you know, there is still uh, going to be uh, some time before the actual, you know, disruption of the construction starts happening. Okay. Um, next much, topic is. Uh, how much do you have left on a rotary over on the Northampton side? Um, that will be mostly finished this year. Before winter, next month or two, or so. Yeah, before winter. All right. Okay. Uh, next topic is uh, bus stops. Um, the plan calls for metal, glass, city-style shelters, and so right now in some of the areas by East Street and the post office and whatnot, we have benches that are a little bit more fitting for the historic area that they're in versus the, the city look of the metal bus stops. Is there any flexibility there to go something in that direction versus the metal shelters? Well, um, you know, I think th there's the opportunity to look at maybe some different styles of shelters. And uh, I think we're proposing one that's a, a typical used by PVTA. Um, but if, the, you know, I, I think that, you know, having shelters is an important part of really making, you know, the transit option uh, attractive, not just in the fair weather, but when the weather's not so nice. And uh, I think that it would be good to have some kind of shelter there. Maybe there is a different style that would be, you know, more fitting with the setting that, um, that the town would like and that maybe Pioneer Valley uh, Transit could agree to. So I, I think that's something that we can explore. And if, you know, a, a couple of locations have a different style of shelter maybe than the rest because of, because of their setting, you know, I think that that would be a good thing to try. Uh, eliminating them altogether and going to just benches again, I think that's, you know, um, sort of uh, short of, of what we're trying to do in terms of making, you know, transit the reliable, dependable, uh, option for Route 9, uh, you know, to get to get more cars off the road and have people using that as an option. So I, I think it'd be good to keep shelters in some style if we can. Okay, I'd just like to see some options that maybe fit in a with a historic appearance. Yeah, a little bit. So, so yeah, we'll look into that and see uh, as far as styles of shelter, if there's something that might be might be better. Okay. And then, so the next two issues. David, what, adding to that, 
the, the my my major concern is the maintenance and the safety and the cleanliness of those bus stops because PBTA, as far as I'm concerned, over the last 10 years, does not maintain them at all, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that, that was my they're next. Mass, they never do complain. In the wintertime, they're, they're, they're out of control. My next two combined topics is uh, the maintenance of the bus stops and the sidewalks. Um, at a public hearing a year or so ago, probably two years now, uh, DOT committed to clearing the new sidewalks that they were installing and the existing sidewalks on Route 9 uh, to the town and the people that were there. That, that was never followed through on. And then afterwards, uh, there was some serious backtracking. And now on a typical snowstorm, they, somebody, I believe it's DOT, snow blows the Coolidge Bridge and either stops at the town line for whatever reason, or sometimes brings it down to Cross Pass, Cross Path Road and then stops. So we're a little bit concerned about, you know, miles of sidewalks and bike paths being installed and then the maintenance burden being placed on the town for those, as well as the bus shelters that are, you know, a lot of times PBTA riders are standing in the street because PBTA hasn't shoveled the bus stops or cleared the bus stops. We don't have the resources to do that. Right. So as far as, um, you know, the ad additional sidewalks and paths that are going to be added uh, with, with this contract. Um, during, during the construction project, the contractor will be responsible for clearing the walks and the paths that are part of the project. Um, they'll also be doing the Norwatic Rail Trail to have that available as an option even during the winter months for someone to avoid Route 9. Um, MassDOT, it, it is our goal to move towards adding pedestrian facilities to our current you know, snow and ice removal, just curb to curb on the, uh, on the roadways. Um, so with, when the project is complete, I expect, you know, we're, we're working towards taking on that responsibility of doing pedestrian facilities. Um, currently it's, it's not our policy and um, it's not something that I can, you know, say that in, when this project is done in 2020, whatever it is, 2025 maybe, that, um, that MassDOT will have the policy at that time of doing those sidewalks. But it is consistent with the goal of our pedestrian transportation plan to move towards that. And, you know, there's a, a fair amount of time also, you know, we do wanna explore if there are other partners who might have an interest in helping out with, um, clearing sidewalks and pathways, but um, you know, that I, I can't say that there's a policy in place today that says we'll do that, but our transportation plan does say that that's our goal is to move to adding pedestrian facilities to what we currently do on, on the roadways. Uh, we really right now do rely on municipalities to you know, clear the sidewalks um, and many municipalities accomplish that through bylaws that put that responsibility on, on abutting property owners. I think that's been talked about in the town, but I, 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 I believe it's still, it, it's not something that exists. Um, but, um, you know, and, and we do, I think we have done the bridge in the past, but it would be, you know, just to uh, get across the bridge and like you say, maybe to cross path road. So, um, you know, currently that's not uh, part of our snow and ice procedures and policy to do to do sidewalks along our state highways. But so that, I'm, that I'm, is I'm, the direction I'm, we're moving. But I can't tell you that we're there and that, you know, um, um, it, I, I can guarantee that policy will be in place. But I do expect that MassDOT will be, you know, by the time the project is done, um, in the position to, you know, probably take that on at that time. I mean, I, I'm hearing a lot of uh, lack of compromise here. I mean, there's a lot of mandates, a lot of unfunded mandates being placed on the town here from 
you know, the bus stop maintenance to the sidewalks on and on and on uh, with the current sidewalk extension down toward Amherst that was put in in front of the Marriott and some of those other locations, uh, you know, where the sidewalk was curving around telephone poles and utility boxes and things like that. That was one of our concerns then. And we were told by DOT that that would be taken care of. Uh, you know, it, the way the sidewalks are built, we can't even send a, a snowblower out there because there's all these obstructions in the middle of the sidewalk. So uh, the, the stance the town has taken is that we just don't clear them during the winter because uh, they're in the state layout and it's not something we can afford to do. So, uh, you know, this is another huge unfunded mandate from the state coming onto the town and it's, it's not acceptable the way it's being done. It's also really irresponsible that your snow plows plow heavy snow onto sidewalks and then you expect owners, especially the elderly who live along the west end of Route 9, to clear their own sidewalks. That just isn't possible. We can't make a town bylaw that says owners have to clear sidewalks. And it's a town that's putting, or it's a state rather, that's plowing the snow up onto those sidewalks from Route 9. We have this simple thing in Hadley. If you build it, you will maintain it. It seems like a simple thing, but it's in your layout. You built it, and we don't want it. No, I, you know, I, I understand. And, you know, we, we have a capital program uh, that's funded with federal transportation dollars, and we have operations that we need to do that are funded with state dollars. And currently, you know, we do the operations that currently just consist of clearing the snow from the streets. And I, and I understand that uh, that's, you know, seen as, as not sufficient, but that, that is the current situation. And, you know, um, we have the capital program to build things and it's certainly correct that uh, maintaining and operating them is a different story. But if we, um, you know, uh, want to, uh, I don't know that is anybody saying that this, this project shouldn't move forward and we shouldn't make this investment? We have been going to meetings talking about the development of the Route 9 plan and all along saying things that were wrong with it. And no one has made any change to the plans according to the town's input. We feel okay, like it's being shoved down our throats, frankly. Okay. Um, that you know, the, the E Street intersection is, is a major catastrophe as far as I'm concerned also. You know, 25%, 50%, 75% plan, we're all three lane, and now there's five lanes going in there. Absolutely ridiculous for that intersection. John or John from GPI, would you like to uh, talk about that? We have uh, John Osorio and John Tamburini from our consultants GPI who are on also. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, uh, folks. This is uh, John Osorio, uh, project director with GPI. Um, I, I want to say I'm not in John Tamburini if you're on. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that the... Uh, the design for East Street hasn't changed since public hearing. Um, yeah, that's been the case. It's been yeah. The design for East Street hasn't changed since the twenty five percent plans. Um, we've been showing this layout, yeah, since since twenty fives went in, and they were on display at uh, both public meetings last summer june and in uh september i believe and and uh and the majority of those improvements are really uh, in place to try to really keep route nine moving and i and i and i'm hearing i've been hearing uh, um, you folks uh, speak about the issues that you're having around town with left turns uh, i think it would be um important to keep um you know, traffic operations along Route 9 moving efficiently. <coughs> and this is one of those, uh, you know, designs that would implement that. Uh, if you start to uh, impede left turns, you know, you're really pushing more more traffic flow down Route 9. You want to keep the, flow, the, the traffic flow moving. I, I think the concern was 
East Street onto Route 9, not the left-hand turns from Route 9 onto East Street. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 the design of the intersection as a whole is, is what allows uh, more flow allow, along Route 9. So the quicker we can uh, move traffic off of East Street, the, the, the more time we can add to the Route 9 traffic flow, traffic operations. So they, the one does affect the other. It goes back to the discussion that was happening earlier about, uh, you know, dissuading people from taking the cut throughs and the other routes that aren't aren't made to carry the heavy traffic. And, you know, Route 9 does carry an awful lot of traffic. And the, the lanes in the East Street northbound approach, having having the the lanes there as proposed is to help keep Route 9 working better and not making it worse by having to give more time to East Street and thereby making Route 9 less attractive to stay on, which is, I think, again, what everybody wants is for the traffic to use Route 9 and not, and not the other routes, the cut-throughs. And, and how will that happen when Route 9 becomes one lane each way instead of two lanes? Pardon me? I, the I new follow. construction is Route 9 being one lane in each direction. And how will that make traffic better? All when, right, it's, so, when it's funneling in from a two lane from the bridge to the middle area between Middle Street and East Street, it's two lanes. And when you get down to the malls, it's two lanes in each direction, but you're going to make it one lane in the other places. Right. No. So, so where, where Route 9 is currently a lane in each direction, it will be a lane in each direction, plus there's an added lane in the middle uh, for left turns so that people who are making the left turns to access uh, the properties along Route 9 will be able to move out of traffic into that center left turn lane and they'll be you know out of the way of the traffic that the through traffic that's continuing and the through traffic will be able to continue uh, unimpeded with the left turns basically out of the way using the center left turn lane so we're not we're not reducing any lanes in the sections that are already four lanes but the two lane sections today will basically become three lane sections with the lane in the middle being just four left turns. And if we have people going the full distance from the bridge to the Amherst line, and then they have to narrow down from two lanes to one lane, that's going to impede traffic. And the well, traffic flow. It, you can't again, tell me that taking two lanes into one lane doesn't make things go slower. No, I, I, I mean, you know, this was talked about in the early project development. And, you know, we, I think we, we started with a four lane option, uh, looking at four lanes and making it four lanes throughout the length. So there wouldn't have to be those lane drops. Um, but through, through the process and input, which included with the town, um, you know, the preferred alternative became the three lane option so that there would be uh, more opportunity in the lanes, the, the two lane sections for each lane of travel to continue with the left turns being removed from, mm. from those lanes of travel. I believe in the meetings that the board was more pushing for the four lane and you folks are pushing for the three lane. So you didn't have to take so much property so you didn't have to go through all the environmental permitting to widen the road where all the drain pipes uh, cross. You guys were involved in all of that. Right. So, so yes. So there are, there, there are multiple considerations and factors that need to be considered when we're doing a project like this. And, you know, it, we, we try to balance those and we certainly respect that other people see that that balance is achieved in some other fashion. Um, but ultimately, you know, we select the alternative that we think gives the balance that 
um, keeps the, the cost in line, that um, limits the environmental impacts, limits the right-of-way impacts, um, and you know, it, it, it's it's about trying to reach that balance. And that's and, why I say, <laughs> that's why I say you didn't listen to the town's input at all. Well, in all in all of our projects, we we try to make informed decisions and get the input, and you know make our decisions. Ultimately, MassDOT has to make the decision, um, and you know, I, I think I think we did that in in this process, and we listened. The fact that we didn't end up where others thought that we en ended up. You know, again, I, I respect that, but ultimately, you know, we move forward with the project that we think is the better project and achieves those balances. So, but who is it better for? Who was who, who did you finally determine that it was better for? Was it better for the state and not the towns that you're going through? Because we we sit in the middle of Amherst and Northampton. And we're always wondering who makes the, the decisions. Is it better for Amherst or is it better for Northampton? Because they're right. the ones that are traveling through us. Well, ultimately, you know, MassDOT projects, MassDOT decides what project we're going to implement. As I said, we try to make that informed and hear the opinions and, and listen to that and, and use it in making our decisions. But ultimately, you know, MassDOT has to make the decision and move forward with a project that um, that we believe balances, you know, the, the users, the people who drive it, the people who live along it, you know, the towns that it goes through. But certainly, you know, you're not going to do something that uh, every one of those people and every one of those interests will think that it's the best project for them. And I understand that. So since we're not getting anywhere on any of the other requests, is there any chance that you can um, help the town with our traffic flow problems and remove the no turn on red signs from Middle Street uh, at the Route 9 intersection at least so we can hopefully, you know, I, I know that there's a process that has to be gone through, but is there any way to expedite that request? Um, well, we, we can look at it. I mean, we've... Um, this is an issue that we have at other locations. And, uh, you know, usually based on concern about people using the crosswalks, um, you know, the, the signs, the signs are put up, but is this something that you've also discussed with uh, our traffic person? Uh, not yet. Not yet, well, okay. So, it so it's something that we can certainly look at and see if it's something that can be done. We actually voted on it two years ago when you did phase two, that we didn't want them there. And uh, at some point, someone at district two said they're staying. There was no right. discussion it, about it. it. It may be that the way the signal operates, they need to be there. But we'll, uh, again, if, if you want to write and request that we look at it again, we will. When, when you actually were doing the intersection at the time um, and there was a, the signs were down, the traffic flowed. We didn't have any accidents at that intersection. Everybody, you know, just did what they needed to do. And you still have the uh, walkways that had their, the button and it, it stopped traffic and stuff. So, I mean, it did work at one time uh, when you were in the, in the development of uh, redoing that intersection. So, Maybe that's something that we can add to the letter for the traffic person. Uh, that would be that would be a good thing to include in that letter about the no left turns. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else for uh, DOT on the Route Nine project before we move and, on? And you're saying the start of it because some of the businesses were wondering you're going to start 2021, 21. The project will be advertised for bids in 2021. And given the length of time it takes from advertising the project for bids 
to actually awarding the contractor and the contractor getting started. It'll be at the very end of 2021, probably before um, something is able to start there. And again, depending on the weather, you know, it may be that not much happens until the spring of 22. Okay, thank you. But that's a little a little bit ahead of where we are. But given the current schedule, we, we, we need to have, again, to protect the funding that's in place to do the project, we need to advertise it before the end of September next year. Uh -huh. So um, that's the latest it will be advertised next year. And, uh, you know, we, we expect to be, I think, pretty close to that schedule. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us and uh, spending the did, time. Did um, I wonder, did, did you want to discuss any further or is it worth discussing the um, right-of-way documents for the parcels of property that the town needs to sign for um, to, to donate? I mean, <laughs> it sounds like. So it sounds like after saying no for the last 30 minutes, yep. you <laughs> you're want asking for a off. favor in a, in a right away <laughs> documents to be signed. It doesn't sound like that's a fair deal, but that's only my opinion. So I think we'll hold on that for another time. All right. Well, again, for, you know, for, for MassDOT to meet its schedule, eventually we need to have the right of way in place um, to advertise the project for bids. And, you know, if, if, if we need to get the right of way done and the, the, the land damage agreements aren't signed or the rights of entry aren't signed, at some point, you know, we may decide to proceed with eminent domain. Okay. Well, and, and, and actually acquire those rights from the town. All right. Well, then we'll worry about that down the line. And, okay. uh, you know, okay. we'll, like I said, if we want to have a discussion about something like that, it's, it's you know, it's got to work both ways. But I, uh, I do appreciate the time. So thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on next. Um, I real quick, Kestrel taken care of. They've been waiting for a while. So on, uh, let's see, 7.5, Kestrel Trust is asking to put some bog bridges on uh, some trails. So who's here from Kestrel? Yeah, Pete Westover, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Good, thanks. Uh, so you may have seen the maps of the project. Basically, it's a, a one-mile trail that runs through land of both Amherst and Hadley and land of the food bank, which used to be Zala. And the, the goal is to uh, repair some of the badly beaten up wet sections of the trail by putting a narrow uh, bog bridge set up on the wettest spots. So to submit the notice of intent and make it official, we need the signatures of uh, the town of Hadley. And Paulette Kozdeba is here in case she has additional information. Paulette from Conservation. What do you have to say? We, um, we did not feel, uh, Janice and I had a conversation and for Conservation Commission land, because it's going before us for permitting, we did not feel comfortable um, being the applicant, so to speak, in front of our own board. So we were saying that, well, it's town property, even though it's under the management of the Conservation Commission, it um, that the town board that has the right to sign should sign. That's all. Okay. But no issues with the request though, as far as actually putting the bridges. And I, I mean, I know you're gonna review it from conservation, but. Right. Okay. No, we are, we are, there's an existing trail there now and this will help. I mean, the way it, it is, um, you go through swampy areas, you walk through uh, wet areas. So that is causing more damage to the environment there than if, if people were walking on slightly elevated um, board boardwalks or bog bridges. 
Could I get a motion, please? Hey, now's a good time to get Moody Bridge Road train pipe in, huh? What are you looking? What's that a smile on your face? Half a smile, anyway. I can make a motion to approve the bog bridges. I'll second. Any further discussion on the bog bridges? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, aye. Christian, I, I missed what you said. Oh, I said aye. Sorry, I said it at the same time Jane did. All right, sorry. And then Joyce? Oh, I guess so. I was going to abstain, but I'll go with it. All right, so 5 0. Okay, well, thank okay, you. For, thank uh, you very much. All right, appreciate it. All right, so now we'll move on to uh, we have Tony Morales here, I believe, from UMass. And we're going to talk about the spring reopening plan. Hey, David, uh, sorry to jump in. I, um, I'm on here on behalf of uh, Philip Price in the Middle Street driveway issue. I just want to make sure we didn't get overlooked that we were 7.4. Uh, no, we just had some appointments before before that. So uh, we'll, we'll get to you. We, we just uh, got to take care of a couple other items first. Uh, did that come across? Okay, good. All right, so Tony, are you, or, there's Tony. All right, yep. Tony, you wanna tell us about uh, UMass's reopening plan? Sure, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm also here with Nancy Buffon, the Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations. She is uh, in, in your screen uh, as well, if you're looking with the, uh, the full grid. Um, so thanks for having us here today. I'm Tony Marulis, Executive Director of External Relations and University Events at UMass Amherst. Um, I work, uh, you know, on the community relations side of things and uh, meet regularly with um, the uh, now former town administrator or administrator emeritus, David Nixon, and also just the other day uh, met with Carolyn Brennan for the first time. So uh, we were able at that point to talk a little bit about our reopening plans. Um, so Nancy and I are going to just talk to you a little bit about both what uh, what uh, our fall plans look like, uh, just to give you a little perspective, uh, which I'll uh, cover, um, and then Nancy will take us through the spring plans, um, and then of course we'll take any questions that you might have after that. So again, thanks for having us. Um, as you may know from about both accounts and um, you know just uh, uh, from other information that you, you've heard from. Uh, the town administrator. During the fall, we had 1,100 students or thereabouts on campus. Um, just to put that in perspective, we uh, normally have about 13,500 on campus. Uh, last uh, last year, before the shutdown, uh, we were oversubscribed because of the high demand for on-campus housing. We had 14,300. So. Uh, you know, that 1,000 uh, or 1,100 students really um, does account for uh, the much quieter traffic patterns, I'm sure, going through Hadley. Um, I just caught that traffic conversation, so I thought I'd add that in. Um, during that time, uh, when we, we reopened uh, for the fall, we did encourage students who have off-campus housing to stay at home for the semester in recognition of the pandemic. Um, but of course, we recognize that many students were already uh, tied into leases within the area, and many students wanted to come back and, and move into the area. Um, we estimate that in general, there's about 9,000 off-campus students in the area, about 6,500 of them are undergraduates, um, and they, of course, are uh, split up among several communities, Amherst, Hadley, and Sunderland um, primarily. Um, so we have, uh, during the fall semester, we've set up an extensive testing and contact tracing operation at the Mullen Center. Um, this is thanks to all of our students, or many of our students in the College of Nursing and the School of Public Health and Health Sciences. Um, at the start of the fall, we required all of our students living on campus or off to be tested when they came to the area in August. Um, those students that were living on campus uh, and partaking in face-to-face -face classes were tested two times a week and, and continue to be uh, tested two times a week. Um, at the start of the semester, we encouraged our off-campus students uh, not accessing campus to be tested regularly. We did not have a requirement um, uh, at first um, as time went on and our testing capacity was 
uh, we, we knew what our te testing capacity was. We, we upped that and eventually that became a directive to our off-campus students. Um, so, and that is reflected in the numbers. Um, since August 6th, we have conducted over 111,000 tests with an overall positivity rate of 0.15% compared to the state rate of 1.4%. Um, our contact tracing is a critical part of our mitigation. Uh, when someone tests positive, our team is in contact within 2.3 hours on average. The state's average timing uh, for their contact tracers is between 24 and 48 hours. So we're well ahead of the state average. Um, as part of our fall campaign, we've deployed an extensive public health uh, education campaign, both on and off campus. Um, and we've continued to refine that as the semester has gone on. And Nancy could probably talk about that even more a little bit later. Um, and all of this effort has allowed us to catch and isolate clusters quickly. And as you all are aware, you know, a couple of weeks back in, in, um, uh, in September, uh, we did have a cluster of about 33 um, from that period of time we were able to identify uh, through contact tracing efforts uh, to go uh, and, and quickly get, uh, you know, those students isolated and quarantined. Um, and over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've seen on a regular basis, either zero positive tests of, of about 3,500 tests a day uh, to a high of three. So we're, we're really well under control at the moment through our testing, um, contact tracing and isolation and quarantine. Um, we're gonna ramp up a lot more of that in the spring and I will let Nancy take it away to talk about that. Thanks, Tony. And uh, thank you again for having us here this evening. So, um, you know, as Tony said, um, we really um, spent the fall putting into place a lot of these systems to make sure that we could um, support redensifying the campus. And we feel that at this point, um, we've learned a lot. We've uh, made adjustments to the testing and contact tracing and public uh, health education campaign as we've gone through. So we feel uh, <clears throat> confident about redensifying the campus. Um, so at this point, uh, what we've done is informed our uh, certain populations that they are invited to come back to campus. So those populations include uh, all of our first year students, the uh, students who may be facing hardships, whether it is food insecurity or housing insecurity, um, international students who um, possibly can't get back home, uh, but students who uh, really uh, need help with housing. Um, and students who have essential face-to-face -face classes that they need in order to continue to make academic progress. So that um, we're aiming for about 60% occupancy in the residence halls. We are not expecting to be at that number. We don't uh, think that every student is going to want to be on campus. Um, for instance, I have a UMass freshman upstairs in my house and I think he's gonna stay there in the spring. Um, so people are just going to make the decisions that work best for, for them. And we're, we're not expecting to necessarily be at that 60%. We are also not expecting to backfill. So if a student does indicate that, um, they are going to continue to be remote, we are not going to then invite a student from, um, outside of the identified populations to come onto campus. So 60% will really be the max. We looked um, carefully at uh, how, you know, what number we thought we could handle on campus. And there were a couple of things that went into that. Uh, there were many things that went into it, but two of the primary things I want to focus on um, just briefly are the, uh, for, from a public health standard, looking at the ratio of person to plumbing fixtures and trying to keep that um, at a safe amount and then also making sure that we can set aside enough space for quarantine and isolation to support that population on campus. Um, some other changes that we're doing around for our off-campus students, because we still expect to have our students um, in the area uh, living uh, in off-campus apartments and houses. Um, one of the things that we were not able to do for the fall semester was to require that the students submit a local address. And part of that was because the returning students had registered for their classes 
way back in April. And so we didn't have a mechanism for requiring that information. The, the way that we have timed the announcement um, for the spring, class registration actually starts, uh, I think it's Monday. And so we are able to have a mechanism that we can require students to submit their on their off-campus address um, before they can be, uh, before they'll be allowed to register for classes. So that information will help us um, to ensure compliance around testing, and also it will be very helpful um, with contact tracing. The other piece that we're doing with our off-campus students is that we will be requiring. Um, all students living off campus to come to campus twice a week for testing, whether or not they are taking um, classes on campus or not. So even if they're fully remote and have no access to campus, they will be required to be tested twice a week. So those are, that's just a kind of a quick overview of what we did this semester and what we're looking at uh, in the coming semester. And Tony and I are both happy to answer questions you may have. So the question I've gotten is, what happens when a student doesn't get tested? If they refuse, if they forget, you know, if, if they're not tested as they're supposed to be? Um, so I'm, I'll give my answer. Tony might have additional information. We don't have um, representatives from the Public Health Promotion Center who actually do this work, but we are um, tracking um, students and especially right now it's easier with the on-campus population because that's a defined population for us. And there's a lot of outreach that's happening. So if a student is not coming in and getting tested, they're getting phone calls, they're getting emails, there's conversations um, and they are being encouraged to come onto campus. And uh, for what I've heard is, you know, their kids, they're forgetting about it. And so they get the call and they're immediately saying, oh my God, I forgot to come in and they're coming in. We have had fairly high compliance rates. Um, we've actually been pretty pleased with that. And you know, we will continue to um, lead with education and um, encouragement. We, we will we'll go to discipline when we need to, but right now it's all about education and um, conversation. The only thing I would add with that is with um, the mechanism to capture addresses this coming year uh, or this coming semester, we will be able to follow up with students uh, at their local addresses in a way that we never have been be able been able to do that before. So, um, so we'll we'll have that record. We'll know when people have come in, when they have not come in, and we will be able to be in touch and make sure that they do. So, in driving around town at different times over the weekend, I multiple cars and I, I don't stop and say, Hey, what school do you go to? You know, but we're seeing parties at different places. Are you just waiting for somebody to test positive and to see who was at their parties to see what's going on? How, how is that uh, going? How is that taking place? Or what are you doing about that? So a, a couple of things, Ms. Chunglo, is I, I think that, you know, we, we are in touch and, and in contact with, um, you know, with the chief uh, regularly around, you know, issues within town. And, and what has been reported has been that, that it's been a quiet year for the most part, and that most uh, gatherings have been outside, have been mostly socially distanced, and um, uh, we're and if there have been things that have been broken up that students have been compliant. What we have advised to our students is to keep things small and to keep it safe. I think that we can't expect as much as we try, we, we cannot force the, the off-campus students because we don't, we don't have the legal right. Uh, we can't force them to, to comply. So we, as Nancy was talking about, we, we try to educate, educate, educate. And along, you know, and with that, I think what we're seeing for the most part is that most of our students um, are abiding by that small and safe rule. Um, we, you know, I have the data from Amherst. I don't have data, hard data from Hadley, and, um, but I do have data from Amherst that, you know, says out of all of the noise complaints, and there have been many noise complaints during the years, lower than in years past, but the average uh, police response, they're, they're seeing, uh, you know, numbers at under nine people per gathering, right? So, so that, you know, counts your four roommates in there, maybe a couple of other people that are along, you know, with them. It's much smaller than what we've seen before. 
Um, in the event though, that there is exposure at any one of those events, that's when our contact tracing team goes into play. Um, and that's when, you know, anyone who, uh, through the contact tracers as they discover um, any outbreaks, that's when people go into isolation and quarantine. Um, and with that isolation and quarantine, our contact tracing team checks in with them daily. Um, there is an option to uh, isolate and or quarantine on campus. Some students, uh, you know, have safe accommodations at home and all of the amenities that they need. So um, through the contact tracing process, if it's determined that they're safe at home, uh, then, you know, they can stay in, in their off-campus accommodations. But um, if it's not safe or if it's found not to be safe, then they're brought on campus. So, um, so th you know, that's how things have been handled. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, based upon our rate um, of, of exposure, I mean, obviously we'd like to have zero at all times, but, you know, by what we're seeing, I think we're, you know, it's being handled well. What, what are your Tony's number right now? How many since the start of September have, how many students have actually tested positive? Uh, so it, it's all on our website, but but we have had uh, a total within the UMass community of about 160 cases. That also counts staff and faculty, although that's a much lower amount, right? I think our, 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 most, our two most recent cases that have been positive this week have been staff members who have come through the symptomatic program, not the uh, or, you know, through UHS, not the asymptomatic program at Mullins. Oh. Um, so uh, I don't have that breakdown in the top of my head, but, um, you know, the numbers are updated daily um, uh -huh. with also information uh, around, uh, you know, you know, the, the, so there's always information around the cases if they're on campus or off. Um, uh -huh. We've only had one on campus case uh, thus far. Uh -huh. And I would just add to that, um, when a student tests positive, um, whether they're, they're living on campus or off campus, UMass handles all the contact tracing. Um, so they'll work in partnership with the um, Board of Health or Department of Health in a, in a local town. But um, we, are, we are taking on the work of doing the contact tracing for students who are testing positive um, in the community. Okay. I mean, it so, seems like you, you, UMass has done a really good job in uh, 162. Yes, I agree with you. We'd like it to be zero, but uh, in today's world, um, in the number of people that you have, you know, it's not as many as you used to have, but the traveling through the communities that, you know, 162 is a minimal amount compared to uh, other areas of Massachusetts and uh, the one time I'm very thankful I live on this side of 495 and not the other side, because um, we are Western Mass, if everybody doesn't know that. But anyway, um, uh, uh, the numbers are more down in that area than they are out here. Um, and keeping those numbers low is, is certainly our goal, um, especially with me affiliated with Cooley Dick and uh, knowing, I think, only at this point we have uh, one patient in. So I think that's pretty good in this time. Um, so Tony, while you're here, uh, Board of Health uh, was inquiring about representation on some sort of committee uh, regarding COVID. And so I wanted to, uh, I think Dr. Moser's here. So um, is that something that we should have a, rep a representative on? Is this <sighs> So, so that, that's a great question. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as I've related to Molly Keegan in conversation about this, um, you know, uh, the, the town gown reopening working group, which really should be the town of Amherst, UMass uh, uh, reopening working group is really Amherst specific, you know, in the, in the meetings that we have, and that's the current committee and the meetings that we have in, in there, the um, you know, we're not just talking about testing and, you know, everything that's going on there. There are also other multiple things at play within that own, that, that town gown relationship itself. Um, I think our relationship with Hadley is unique in the same way that our relationship with Sunderland is unique. And, and, and I think that one thing that, that we would certainly be open to is, you know, um, meeting with, you know, our public health team and, and, and the town of Hadley's, you know, board of health and, and, you know, going over everything, if there's any questions, but I'd, I'm just going to joke here and I hope no one from Amherst is listening, but we do not want to subject you to that meeting. So, uh, 
<laughs> so um, if, if, you, if you bear with us, um, you know, we're not opposed to uh, making sure that you have all the best information too. I just think that, uh, you know, uh, the, um, some of the, the, the specificity of that meeting um, would probably take up a lot of airtime. Mm-hmm. And not enough focus on, on the town of Hadley, so. Okay, so it, are there any other town representatives on there other than Amherst at this point? No, okay. no, no, no. Uh, it, it's, it's, we, we do have, we do have um, you know, Mindy Dom, who's the state rep for Amherst, and then, um, you know, State Senator Joe Comerford is on. Um, now, let, let me also say that, you know, uh, after um, we had the cluster in Amherst, there was, a, there was also a, a cluster in Sunderland. We did have a meeting with them, um, you know, to kind of go over what the procedures were. Senator Comerford was a part of that meeting as well. Um, you know, we would, uh, you know, welcome Rep. Carey and, and Senator Comerford to, you know, a meeting uh, with the town of Hadley as well. So, um, you know, we want to be as transparent as possible. And I think that the relationship that we've had with the town of Hadley and in ta- t- with Town Hall over the years has been, been really strong. We want to, you know, ma- make sure that we maintain that. Um, Hadley is uh, one of our host communities. And, uh, you know, 28% of our campus is, is in, in the town of Hadley. We want to make sure that, you know, we're being good neighbors. Dr. Moser, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I would uh, like to take issue with uh, comparing Hadley's relationship with the University of Massachusetts uh, to that of Sunderland. Uh, you know, by virtue of geography and, and commerce, I mean, Hadley is part of the UMass community. Many oh, students, I'm not comparing, I'm not comparing the two. Uh, I'm students not. Students live here and, you know, oh, yeah. Many, many more are, you know, every day visiting our retail stores, mm-hmm. our restaurants, our movie theaters, our gyms. And, you know, the Hadley Board of Health would like a seat at the table where policy recommendations are, are being made regarding UMass and the surrounding communities. Again, I, I don't think that the uh, recommendations that we're talking about within the, the town gown working group are necessarily policy related to, you know, our public health stance. So, I, I th- you know, Dr. Mosler, you know, again, this is not a comparison between Hadley and Sunderland. I'm just bringing up the fact that, you know, again, we also have students in, in, in Sunderland. Hadley is a completely different thing. Again, it, Sunderland's not a host community. Hadley is. And so, you know, we recognize that. And we, we understand Hadley's importance. Uh, to, you know, uh, the university and, and our connection, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship there. So, um, so I, I'm certainly not suggesting that um, anything around policy or concerns that you may have would be discounted. Um, uh, you know, we, again, we welcome the meeting and, and we can set something up. We, we yeah, think we're... that it would be better to have a, a separate meeting, the, the current town gang group. It's just, it's very Amherst centric. And in order to make sure that we can have a full conversation about um, issues of concern for the Board of Health and Hadley, a separate meeting is is just much more warranted. Sounds great. And and I, I can be in touch with, um, you know, with Ms. Brennan about that and make sure that we get that on the books. Great, thank you. Certainly. Anybody have any final questions before we move on? Thank them. Thank uh, Tony and um, yeah for for coming tonight. We really appreciate you uh, sharing with us all your uh, facts and everything. And uh, uh, again, it's always good that we need to work together on this. It's important. Well, thanks for having us, and we'll be happy to be back anytime. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Stay safe. All right. Um, let's see, we're going to go back to, uh, 7.4 driveway request for middle street and Carolyn or David, why don't you introduce this and tell us what's happening here and what's being asked. David, did you want to up, did you want to start or? Yeah, so I'll be happy to start. So we have a request from a uh, a resident of uh, 113 Middle Street uh, to, uh, um, as part of a reconstruction, reconfiguration of a residential uh, property 
to expand and continue using um, a driveway which is situated on, on property, at least partially. This is a uh, this is a situation that's been uh, going on for quite some time that the uh, part of town property has been used for a private uh, parking area, um, and with the proposed remodeling reconfiguration of the building, um, that uh, parking area would be expanded uh, and uh, requires the town approval for that to happen. So that's the Reed property that is abutting the driveway that goes to the backfields of Hopkins Academy? I believe so. So they're asking to park where they normally park. I see that there is a paved roadway going to the back part of the Hopkins Academy. Used to be the softball field. Is that correct? Is that what we're looking at? I believe so. Oh, that's a new walkway. That's a walkway? That's a new walkway to the fields. Okay, from Middle Street. And yeah. so what do they want? They're parking there. I see them. I see cars parked on that property. So what is there? What do they want to do? I think the issue is they're parking on town property, right? And so they're asking to continue this. I'm sure Bill can shed some light on this. He's, yeah. uh, I mean, I'd like to see them if they're reconfiguring the property to make parking and make a driveway on their own property. Is Bill Dwyer there? Have they been asked to go to the planning board? Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> they will be coming to us. They they have actually uh, been to us once. Uh, they have not filed anything yet. <clears throat> Basically, what happened apparently is that when the driveway was originally laid out, it was laid out on the town-owned portion of land. The town owns a strip of land from middle street into the softball field mm -hmm. and the driveway was apparently originally laid out in that strip of land mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was not discovered until the property owners explored putting an accessory apartment in for an in-law apparently mm -hmm. um, so yes they are on they are using town property to access their parking area. Uh, the parking area, I think, is mostly on their property. Uh, I'll, I can't look at the map at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, <clears throat> the question is whether it is something that would require reopening, you know, cutting in a new driveway or just letting the old one continue. Uh, the one piece of information I cannot provide is whether or to what extent the school has plans to use that piece of town-owned land for um, school purposes or access to the fields going forward. Uh -huh. Is there anything in a, a bylaw or a general rule or law bill about... Um, you know how you have a common driveway to certain houses and it becomes a right of way. Um, does this apply here at all or not? Not, not directly. We do have a bylaw that requires access across uh, frontage. <clears throat> and then we have an option to do access across other than frontage by special permit. Mm -hmm. So I would anticipate that if the property owner was able to make their case to your board mm -hmm. that they'd like to just leave things the way they are, the way they have been for a number of years, that we would uh, probably do an access across other than frontage special permit at the same time we do the accessory apartment special permit. Mm -hmm. um, it's not unlike what you did when you uh, gave V1 um, yeah. Oh, yeah. But parking the right to drive to the back of their building across town land. Mm -hmm. It just really comes down to whether the town or specifically the school department has a better, higher, and better use for the land. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How, 
Bill, do you know how much the town, uh, the school department actually owns there? Because there's got to be a big easement for that drainage ditch there. Uh, that was a ditch at one time before they put the pipe in down middle street. Okay, so I could probably pull up a plan for oh, what the town owns, but that- Oh, it's still on, you know, maybe she's got a little more input on that or- That's not the drainage ditch per se. That was, I think, intended to be an alternate access to the, uh, the back end of the fields because it seems to go with the school property. <clears throat> we had a survey done for the trustees of the other properties that were conveyed to the town, but this was not property that was being conveyed to the town, so it wasn't included in that survey. Uh, so I, I don't have a specific answer, but I think it's 100 feet or so. Uh, it's not a it's not a building lot, but it is a a decent size access way. So uh, Christopher Lee is here. He's the representative for the homeowner. And uh, Christopher, I guess my question is, why can't they put their parking on their own property versus town property? Yeah, sure. So the uh, we where we are proposing to put the parking on on their property. Um, part of the rules to do the accessory apartment, we have to the planning board has to see three parking spots on on their property. Uh, as Bill was saying, the issue with us just adding three parking spots on their property at the end of this driveway is that the zoning bylaw also states that the driveway must cross the front yard lot line, and right now it's crossing the side lot line. Um, so we're faced with a situation of um, needing to tear up the tree belt and put trees at risk to put in a new driveway, or just continuing to use the driveway as it's been used for the last 50 to 70 years. Um, in some way that's acceptable to the town, whether this is uh, redrawing the lot lines, doing purchasing the parcel for us for a nominal sum of money, um, or having the town give some kind of written consent saying that we can enter through this side lot line. Well, I, I don't think selling the property is in the realm of possibilities here since that's access to the schools, um, but um, the other issue I have is setting a precedent for other projects in the future that may be needing the same thing. So um, I think we maybe we need to take it under advisement and come back to this at a later time. Well, I think I have a question. It, so they have been using this existing driveway, which I assume is the dotted line from Middle Street up to where it says existing drive and parking for more than the number of years needed to claim right of ways. And they're now saying they would move the parking over to their land. I don't see a problem. They're not gonna park on town land anymore. They're gonna drive on town land. Yeah, there, there's no claim to a right of way just by using it at this point. Um, and I think well, all, the, all the driveways on Middle and West Street all cross town property to get to their property because we all have a tree line on, on both of those streets. So crossing the town property to get to their own property, that's always been there. So I'm not exactly sure what the question is. They're gonna keep their parking on their own property. They just have a right of way to go across our property. I move we let this happen and, and be done with it. I don't have a problem. I mean, this has been, been there forever and um, you know people have parked on Middle Street and gone to the baseball softball games back there for ever um, going across that piece of property there and now it has a walkway so yeah. I don't have a, I don't have a property with right away and letting them continue to park there either after all these years I know that Mr. Yeah. Reed Mr. Reed lived there for many many years and you know we never had a problem with that before so I make a motion I'm sorry, David. Next. Oh, um, it was brought up that with the that the school may be intending to use this uh, town-owned property as part of their athletic field redevelopment. Um, my recommendation is to take this under advisement until your next meeting, which is a week from now, and give the uh, the schools an opportunity to 
inform us as to whether this is critical to their designs and plans? I doubt it, for God's sakes. But anyway, I'll... Uh, a week I'll, seems reasonable. Yeah. Another meeting? Another week in a row? What are you doing to me? Joyce, we're doing these for you. <laughs> I didn't want to have any meetings, but this is this is all your fault, Joyce. Oh, it's my fault. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. I'll make a motion to postpone this until we have more information from the school department. Second. All right. All those in favor. Aye. 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 I think we should meet once a week from now on. I'm with you, John. <laughs> Maybe we could get home in a reasonable hour. Oh, you're all no. funny. Bye. <laughs> all right. uh, Carolyn, can you talk to Dr. McKenzie and see what the plans are for this for the next meeting, please? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we'll move on here. Um, let me go back to consent agenda so I don't forget these warrants. We have uh, warrant AP2118, AP2118S. We have a uh, special town meeting warrant, the select board will sign and a change order for the Plainville Cemetery project. Um, and that's it for consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I didn't say aye. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Five zero. So that's out of the way. Then uh, we're passing over the public forum. Uh, let's do, man, it's getting a long meeting. All right. Real quick. Uh, I'd like if we could ask about the no left turn signs and we need a formal letter. So let's take, let's do that real quick. If someone can make a motion for Middle Street onto Route 9. Yeah. I'm sorry, the no right turn signs on red for Middle Street on Route 9. Yeah, so moved. Second. Any further discussion on that? That was initially put in um, by the triad people because of the seniors and people walking across that street and people are taking a left turn without the light. It's unsafe for pedestrians. Well, pedestrians shouldn't be crossing the street without the lights blinking. Even yeah. when the light is blinking, even when the light is for pedestrians, there are people who will turn on red because they're not looking not for pedestrians. If the crosswalk light is on, they do not move their vehicle, and people don't. And the signs say that don't cross if the cross don't go if the crosswalk light is on. Uh, it's in the rules when you get your license. The oh, come on. How many people know those, John? The railroad crossing at Cumberland Farms. You should see the people going through that red light. I haven't seen anybody been hit at the intersection of Route 9 and Eons. Maybe no, a cars. Not cars, but I've never seen pedestrians being hit. No person or no uh, car has... They've not had an accident at that intersection... The chief, when we discussed this a couple of times, yeah, uh, said that there's never been a problem there. You know, those signs can be removed as far as the chief is concerned. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. Aye. Four one. All right. Uh, Let's see. Let's go to the town building reopening policy. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, so this is really just an update. The select board had voted to um, approve having that fate go into phase B of the soft, kind of a soft reopening uh, after election day. And so we just, um, we have, there's an updated document that you have that goes into a couple areas that we um, wanted to add, which the major changes uh, reflected the employee self-certification, the log maintenance requirements, uh, what we would do with a confirmed case protocol, and a reopen by appointment only protocol. So there's, in that document, there was a memo that from Deborah who worked on this. So thank you very much to Deborah uh, that it highlighted specifically what those changes are um, 
and I can just give you feedback with having the early voting. Um, it seemed to go well, uh, and we'll have, you know, so there were people, you know, staggered coming in the building. Um, but I think uh, just a couple people stayed home, worked from home, but there wouldn't even be that much traffic. It would be a by appointment only. And um, Jennifer's done a great job of getting all of the, um, anything that we need to put up the plexiglass, more additional sanitation. Um, she's been a genius and she's gotten a lot. So um, that's, I just wanted to present that reopening to you. If you wanted to vote on that, if you were comfortable with it and um, how, if you want to definitely proceed for uh, the day after election day to open up by appointment only. I think the numbers are looking fairly good for this area. I would make a motion to open it up for uh, phase D after the elections. It's B. 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 Oh, I pushed it. I pushed it way ahead. I'll go with B. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how much how much did all this cost and where do we take it out of? There's that, I believe, most of it. It's gonna You're pay. Yep, the cares I do I do want to talk about that because Jennifer did a phenomenal job and I think wrapped it up almost today. Um, and Jennifer, you want to give a quick update on all the things that we're submitting for um, to be paid for? Um, sure, real quick. We um, all the departments have gotten almost everything into me. I got a slew more tonight. Um, I have about thirty more grand to add in, but we're looking really good. We're still going to come in under the numbers, so I'll have some. For December, they said it'll probably be a small window in December if we need to apply for anything extra that we didn't, um, <clears throat> excuse me, estimate for. But we have cleaning and the PPE supplies and the plexiglass, um, signage, uh, substitutes for the schools. Literally, the department heads have done like such a great job getting the information to me. And um, I think we're going to be all set for uh, the CARES Act. I'm hoping to turn it in tomorrow. Super. Thank you, Jennifer. Sue, you had something? Uh, no, I just wanted to make sure that we were doing appointment only when that we was, reopen. Yes. That was, that was in the motion. Okay. I mean, I've, I've been going to people's homes, um, but... I just, it, during early voting, people have been coming in going, oh, can you tell me this? And it's kind of like, yeah, it's not quite kosher yet. So um, I just wanted to make sure that it was out there that it's going to be appointment only. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sue, Sue, you should announce your senior center hours. Oh, yes. On Thursdays from one to two, I will do appointments at the senior centers for those folks that uh, that need information about their taxes and that type of thing. Every every Thursday from one to two. Great, thank you. Okay, so all those in favor of uh, reopening by appointment only for town hall. Phase B. Phase yeah. B starting November fourth. Aye. 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 Hi. Sorry, I missed who seconded that. Uh, who seconded the original motion? That was Jane. All right, and so five zero in favor, correct? Okay. Yes. All right, so we get the minutes right. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip, go ahead. David, while we're on this subject, uh, the uh, Zoom meetings for our meetings. Yeah. After the yeah. fourth, we're going to start meeting again. Yeah. Uh, Hadley Media hasn't gotten their equipment, and I haven't heard back yet on a dry run on that yet. And basically, with what's increasing in cases, I'd like to we'll reassess after December our first meeting. Uh, no sense in pushing it. This is working. So we'll just leave it as is. As, as much as I hate running this meeting over Zoom, so. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip the 
updates for the library fire station senior center the only thing i would ask is that as someone make a motion we withhold um the opm's most recent invoice payment until we're able to meet with the opm and the trustees um and get get the full story before we release that payment for september yeah i'll make the motion i, I definitely want a meeting with the trustees and uh the uh, building committee is dissolved now, or we don't uh, oh. it is. What's going on, Christian? No, the building committee still exists. The, the less trustees still exist. So I don't, I don't know what's going on, I guess. I got an email today that really threw me for a loop. So I have no idea what's going on, but I'd ask that we up our communication game a little bit so that we're all on the same page. It seems like we're going in different directions. So. Um, we're great, yeah, we're great at lack of communication. We need to do something about it, this board, all of us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're being told by people on the building committee that they've held their last meeting. So we just need to straighten it out. And, uh, you know, we'll just hold on. I'd like to just hold on to the money until that happens, uh, just so that way we're not paying people if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, okay. But on the other side of that, I would like to say that I, having talked to David Phil, I'm going to try and organize a meeting and get all the players in the same space at the same time so we can know what's going on and try and do it before our next meeting. Yep, sounds good. So um, John, have a motion. is there a second? Second. All, right. all those in favor? Aye. 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 No. No. Uh, Jane, what was yours? I didn't hear, sir. Aye. Okay, so four one. We're talking one week, basically. Exactly. Okay, and then let's do the cleaning award. Um, Carolyn, do you want to talk about this? I know, I know, you, I think you took it over. Um, what our options were and and why why this recommendation? So, and I, and I will involve Jennifer. She um, she you know. It was a primary person putting this behind under the direction of um, the select board wanting to go out to bid for the cleaning services. So in October, early October, she um, and I, um, I think I think you had help with Deborah as well. Is that right, Jennifer? Deborah, Chris, and Jane. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And so she got the bids back, and the lowest bidder did not meet the minimum qualifications. So the uh, Second lowest bidder. Uh, do you have that name, Jennifer? Anna's Deep Cleaning. Thank you. On page, yeah. Thank you. So, um, presenting that to you as the lowest bidder, and if you wanted to award that. My understanding of her bid was she did not include the exterior work that we all had felt was going to be important in terms of having somebody on maintenance for the buildings. Those were alternate bids and they were not a requirement of the people who bid on them. You didn't have to submit the alternates. That was one of the original thoughts from all the people who talked about hiring somebody and I don't know how they got put in as alternates versus non-alternates. What's, what's exterior? What are we doing on the exterior? The thought was originally, this all came up from Marlowe before Chris was even on board, that with the new buildings, in order to plan to keep them well kept and in order, and because they were going to be bigger and more maintenance, that there should be an on-site person, prefer originally we thought it was going to be a DPW hire, who would, in case of snow or leaf or things like that, be available to keep the outsides of the building prepared so that like the sidewalks could be cleaned before the piles would come in. And like for election next week, somebody who was going to clean the leaves off so they're not tracked into the building, that level of thing, and possibly do other minor maintenance things like bulb changing, etc. cetera. Yeah. Well, right now, you know, it's Gary Bird, but we're, uh, 
we're in a freeze right now on hiring anybody extra at this point. Um, so if we can depend on our DPW to take care of the outside as they do our other town buildings, I think that's what we have to look at right now. I think the issue is that we've added three new buildings for them to have to look at, and that's not in their scope of capability in terms of time right now. You know, we've got a new fire station that's got to be kept clean so the engines can get out. We have libraries and senior centers that people have to be able to get into. Well, they're not going to plow the fire station to get the fire trucks out. So that's not even in that realm of plowing and stuff. That's all DPW and whatever that takes care of the plowing at our central station. It'll have to do the North Adley station also. I, Joyce, I think we were looking more at the sidewalks and the sidewalk maintenance because it was just Gary. And at the end of the storm, there's sometimes three or four trucks, as you probably see at the town hall, at the library. All yep. the crew gets together at the end of the storm to do all the sidewalk work. And we were thinking that if we could get somebody to do some of that work, uh, it would free up the highway guys who sometimes we're working around the clock, uh, taking uh -huh. care of the roads. Yeah, I mean, I know that one of the concerns of the DPW director, I think he's he was on here. I don't know where to go. Um, anyways, was the snow removal for the library and the senior center because with the the new buildings opening and the town and everything else, the the amount of time those parking lots are going to take due to their configuration is is going to be a, a little bit of a burden. So, um, but maybe we have to contract out with somebody else for that or leave it as kind of last priority on the list, unfortunately. But it's something sure. we can't not do. We have these buildings and we have to maintain them and we have to make them accessible to people who are using them because I know the library will be opening for minimal action. The senior center is currently having programs with limited numbers of people and saving a nickel here because we hired somebody who wasn't able to do that as opposed to hiring somebody in-house. And I don't know what the numbers look like compared to what Deborah gave me earlier for what it would be to hire somebody full time with benefits, I think if it's if we can get what we need for the same price that we could hire somebody in house and have more control over them, then I don't think we should award the contract. I mean, I, I, I'm not in favor of hiring anybody at this point as a town employee. There's, I mean, that's a hard no for me based on what we just did with the taxes and everything else. I mean, what's the difference between hiring a town employee or hiring a subcontractor if it costs the same amount of money? Well, one thing we have a hiring freeze and a contractor we can get rid of at any time by terminating the contract uh, versus a town employee that uh, results in payoffs, extended benefits, retirement, on and on and on. So it's, it's not something that I'm in favor of right now. I, I do agree with Jane on keep, you know, I think we should hire, I kind of disagree, I guess, with you, David, just as I feel like we could hire somebody to do this job. It's a, a good job uh, for someone. And I mean, for the prices they're asking for the alt ones and alt two, I mean, it seems like we could have another person at the DPW uh, doing that, but um, it seems like a lot of money for what we get here in the end. So our, I guess, uh, what direction are we going? Are we gonna hire one of these contractors? Um, I, I'd like to know who, uh, who was doing the cleaning before that left us? She did not leave us. When we were all exposed to COVID-19, her doctor said you need to pause in the cleaning of the buildings until we know what's going on. The building still needed to be cleaned at that time. So Gary Berg did an emergency procurement and brought somebody else in. As I understand, a contract was signed. Chris Okafer is here now, David, so he might be able to answer this better if he wants to step in. But as I understand, that's why we're still with quality and not with honest deep cleaning who was doing the cleaning beforehand. I don't know if Chris wants to step in. Yeah. 
There he is. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to step in. I thought uh, the last time I spoke with the town administrator, she said she was going to call a, a set up a meeting for us to discuss. I would have liked to discuss this uh, before we get to the select board. Anna is a, a good contractor, but I don't think uh, she has met some of the requirements that I would like to see. Um, the co we still have COVID-19 and the cleaning is uh, very different from Anna's cleaning before COVID-19. Uh, she's a one person uh, contractor. We have more new buildings coming online and they have to be cleaned more than once or twice a week. I was, I was looking forward to hearing from her how she intends to do them. I, uh, so that's uh, before recommending to the town administrator or the select board uh, to, for, for her to be hired as a contractor. At this point, if the select board approves her to be the contractor, it's public works that will be responsible in policing her, but uh, public works has not been given the opportunity to speak to her. I see Chief Speckman will turn on his camera. So he must that's, ask what I, that's what I'm trying to say. We've, we've got another company right now that's been yes. doing an exceptional job during COVID. Yes. Um, in the best interest of the town, I don't believe we should take the low bid right now. I think we should uh, continue on with the person that we have. I don't necessarily mean that we should continue with the person we have. The person we have is doing a good job. Yeah, but if Anna uh, can demonstrate that she can meet that standard, even at the lower rate, I would recommend to the board. But at this point, I um, I don't know if she can. Because in the past, even town hall employees have complained about her cleaning, uh, the standard, and so, and now with COVID-19, the standard is more stringent. And so I really want to make sure that um, at a minimum, uh, she meets, she agrees to meet certain requirements. If she's sick or she's not able to meet a particular building for a particular day, uh, what is the default? Is she going to send us her brother or her family member or somebody else? When I need to know some, we need some criteria, some standard from her. I don't have that standard. Maybe she has provided that to the town administrator, but not to my knowledge. Chief. I just wanted to be transparent that Anna is back to cleaning at the fire station twice a week, police and fire she is doing. Um, she's done a great job over here, but I understand where Chris is coming from on, uh, because it seems like there's a bit more added to it. I. Also wanted to state that we, uh, I've been in conversations with Chris, you and I have talked about, you know, our new brush truck that we've, uh, we have a plow on it now so that we can help with cleaning up the fire station, this station and the new station. Our, our day crew on the fire side shovels, uh, shovels the walks. And then we actually, uh, we have a contract with Jake Sabasco, um, who does the sidewalks overnight, which is called in by the dispatchers if needed. So that's what we have in place right now. That's We've had that for probably five plus years now. Um, so anyways, I just want to make sure everybody was aware that we're, we're chipping away as much as we can during the day and we'll support Chris and his crew however we can um, with, with staff and with cleaning out our spaces. Yeah. Um, I just, I do want to say the big documents that were given to me had the standards that I was told were put in there in place by Jane and Chris working with Deb Radway. And so those are the standards that we bid out on. And these are the responses that we got in return. Um, and also, um, and I was trying to get David Nixon to answer me, but is snow removal something you have to bid out or can you just hire contractors, David? Because we're already looking for people to do shoveling. I can answer that. I can answer that, Jennifer. This, the snow is yeah. the snow removal 
it's not my major uh, concern. I know it's an option. The cleaning of the of the building is my major concern. Now, couple of uh, having an option is 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 usually a good opportunity to see uh, what is out there. So the town has a, uh, a right to pick up the option or not to pick up. But the cleaning schedule uh, before COVID nineteen, we have the new council on aging right now. We have the library coming in. We have uh, the new uh, library and the old library. We have the town hall. The standard of cleaning right now is different from pre-COVID-19 that Anna left us because of illness. So- I'm gonna ask you to stop saying that she left because of illness. Um, uh, the, that, I, the, I don't think that's a fair response. No, she, she was not she, ill. That was not, Ill, that's not, I'm not condemning her for doing that. She was ill. It's not her fault to be ill. But what I'm saying is among the, the B that you have, because Anna has history with us, it's easier for me to ask some questions or, but I wasn't given the opportunity to ask those questions. That was why I said that the town administrator should call a meeting so we can put together some questions. It's possible that Anna may have the answer. If she has the answer, that is fine, but I don't know. David Nixon and Sue had something as well. Okay. Yeah, Anna did not leave because of illness. Anna had a, a, con, a higher condition um, that made her more susceptible. So her doctor she said- She was immunocompromised. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I will tell you that Let's jump in uh, right now. Susan, time out. Yeah. We're we're way into HIPAA territory here. I know we are, but let's my, talk about this. Let's stop. David, go ahead. You had some time. Okay. Sorry. Um, thank you, David. Um the select board asked us to go out to bid for cleaning services. And that's what uh, uh, Carolyn and Jennifer did. Uh, they did it in consultation with, uh, with uh, uh, Council on Aging and DPW. Uh, and they put together the best bid package that they could. They sent it out. They have to follow the rules under chapter 30B, section five. They've identified a responsive and responsible low bidder. And so they're making that recommendation to the board. Um, if we don't choose that, uh, that particular bidder, it's because you're gonna reject all bids. If you skip over that bidder, um, you're likely to generate a bid protest. That's why I said, David, in the best interest of the town, low bid may not be acceptable to us. And that is acceptable to the town. Okay. Well, I need a motion in one direction or another here. So, or we can defer this until I'll next. I'll make a motion week. not to accept the low bid right now at this point. Was Anna's bid the low bid? Wasn't there someone below her? The Lyodon cleaning was the lowest bid. They did not meet the minimum requirements that were set in place for the, the bid that went out. They did not meet them, so we moved to the next lowest bidder following the MCPO procurement laws that we have and that we follow. Linda. Just on the money, I just paid a bill today for $9,500 for the month of September, and you'll see your low bidder is coming in at 5000 something. If money's an issue, I think that's something you ought to consider. If you put it off, you're continuing at that rate. Okay. All right, can I get a motion? Yeah, if, one last thing. If we accept the, this bid, there needs to be an escape clause in the contract if work is not being performed up to service, expected. David. I made the motion to reject the low bid. Is there a second or not? I can second that. 
motion okay. to so we have a motion on the table to reject uh the lowest acceptable bid which is honest cleaning uh, any further discussion on that i don't think it was acceptable because it didn't include all the things that we asked to be put in it as actual things that were put in is options or added add-ons that was how the bid was given to me from deb radway and that was what i was told y'all wanted I'm sorry, Deb did not show it back to either Chris or myself before she sent it to you and we asked for it. I was surprised to see it that way. Okay. Any further discussion? So the motion is to reject lowest acceptable. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Hi. So are we going to go out to bid again without the options or? Rewrite the bid. Yeah. I hate to be wasting money on this. You yeah. are? Well, what are we going to do? Can I, you, so you're, you, the motion is to reject the lowest acceptable bid. So, but really what you're saying is you want to reject all bids and go back out. Yeah, if, the, if there was a problem with the bidding, then we need to go back out and we need to address every issue with every building, as Jane was saying. Now, so, I, I guess David my, Dixon, my I'm question sorry, David. is, is there a problem with the bid or do we have the option to pick someone that's not the lowest bidder based on, no, okay. Okay. So then I guess that would be by rejecting the lowest acceptable bidder, then we are going back out. So be it. Move on. Well, I'm sorry. Can I just have clarification from David Nixon? Do they need to make a motion to, to reject all bids? Um, no, the, by, by eliminating the uh, lowest responsive and responsible bidder, uh, by law, we'd have to go out to rebid. Okay, thank you. Okay, can we um, put a shorter time frame on this so that way we can get this done so we're not paying this $9,000 a month for cleaning? Yeah, we have a good start for the job description. Let's just get it all included. All right. Can I put together a working group of the people who need to be involved and we can get the list together correctly at this time? You may. Okay, if you want to be on it, if you could email me. Well, who do you, you got the police chief, fire chief, DPW, Jane, you're on it. Who else? That's probably enough. Well, Deb was on it from HR. I, I would like to be a part of it if it's possible. And yeah, if it's possible that I could go on Monday, because I'm about to, well, I'm about to do a three-day procurement class. <laughs> so... I would love to be able to do that next week, but if you're in a hurry, certainly I, I would love to uh, be a part of it. And, and uh, is Chris still on it? I'd like to see Gary on there with it. You know, he, he knows pretty much most everything about the building, so. Yeah, Gary, Gary will be part of it. All right, thanks, Chris. Okay. So I'll, I'll send an email out and we'll get everybody together on Monday. Great. All right. Thank so you. The, um, Anything else? I think that's about it for the agenda. Any last night? Up, oh, Jennifer, go ahead. Um, I'm going to ask, um, we had Eslon and Mutiera ask um, yesterday afternoon about um, extending their outdoor liquor licenses. I'm still working with the ABCC to understand this correctly, but can I please ask the select board to make a motion to allow all of our liquor licenses who already hold the um, extended outdoor license to allow them to extend it um, past the November 1st um, deadline. Sure. Make a motion. I'll make that motion. <laughs> did you make it, Joyce? I'll second it. I did make it. Thank you, Jane. Uh, You're muted, David. Motion by Joyce, seconded by Jane. Any discussion? All those in favor. Aye. Did we need to vote on anything Aye. on Hold well, wow, on, we got to vote. Joyce. Oh, I, I did vote. Aye. I made the motion. Aye. 
John said yes. Christian, what were you? I was a yes. All right. I'm a yes as well. And, and is that it? Did I miss anybody? It, five, nothing. All right. Thank you. It's been a long night already. Yeah. What about Texas Roadhouse? Was that in the discussion tonight? No, um, we're waiting for that for the next meeting, Joyce, so we can have a good time with you. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Well, there's nothing good on TV um, Wednesday nights anyway, so we're okay. I'm going to go grab something to eat over there. I'll ask him. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Thank you, Christian. I'll go with you. We'll have a drink. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, any announcements, anything we forgot for, for tonight? I don't think so. I just want to make sure that I announced um, the passing of Edwin Buckhout. You know, we had that little blackout there uh, um, a few weeks ago when we, weren't all on and I was kind of in the black here. So I'm not exactly sure if uh, that one came across or not. He's been uh, a good community person. He was the husband of Merrill, um, raised many children in Hadley here. And um, so condolences to his family. Um, I just want to make sure I mentioned Ann Salvatore, Joy Tudrin and Andy Jekinowski, um, all local people that have passed. And want to make sure that they their families had heard that we extended our condolences to all of their families also. And that's it for me tonight. Oh, who's got the trunk or treat for to Friday night? Thank you. <laughs> there you go, Carolyn. I was going to I was going to remind them, but yes, trunk or treat. <laughs> trunk or treat on Friday night and it starts at what time? 5 o'clock. 5 to 7. 5 to 7. Thank you, Mike. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Got your costume? Or are you going to be a firefighter? <laughs> uh, chief Mason and I are going to switch. I'm going to be the police chief. He's going to be the fire chief for the night. Whoa. Tell me how that works out. <laughs> You're going to have one really good looking fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're both great looking, but thank you. Thank you from the community for doing this. It's uh, really appreciated. Thank you. We, we did have a bunch of questions from uh, uh, people at school drop off. Uh, Halloween is not canceled. We have not canceled Halloween. So it's up to parents and families. If you want to go trick or treat, follow the governor's guidelines. If the light's on, people are participating. If the light's off, people are not. But that's up to individuals to decide. Uh -huh. And that would be Saturday night, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. So. David, real quick, I said I wasn't going to do a town administrator report to give you more time, but just two things, the tax classification hearings on November 18th, and um, everything has been submitted to accounting um, and Department of Revenue for free cash certification, so I wanted to make sure you all knew that. Okay. And in my usual, each week that we meet, because it's my job, please wear your mask, please be safe, please sanitize, please wash your hands all of that good stuff and be thankful we live in this community um, that we're all trying to keep ourselves safe and everyone else also. So be safe all week, everybody, and look forward to seeing you all next week. Yeah. Goodbye, Joyce. All right. Good night. All right. Motion. Motion, Motion to adjourn. To adjourn. <laughs> Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Good night. <laughs>